glad. Good morning. Welcome to chapel. We are glad that you're here. Let me just ask you something. If you have been welcomed this morning by someone as you came into the room, would you raise your hand? That's good. That's good. We want you to be welcome. We're so glad that you're here this morning. We are delighted that as we come together each and every time, we are regularly worshiping Jesus and thinking about all of life in relation to Jesus. And this chapel is especially one where you see I don't have instruments behind me, thinking about life in relation to Jesus. And I think you're going to be, I hope, incredibly encouraged about what the Lord may use you to do in this year, in today, this week, and in the coming years. I'll say a little bit more about that in just a second. Let me give you a few announcements here. At the very end of chapel today, you'll hear from Joshua Gilmore as he will give announcements about church jobs, part-time, available to you, and you can stay after and hear about those. So he'll tell you a little bit more. Be ready to stay after at the end. We'll make sure you get scanned. Don't worry about that. Commuter lunch, I want to remind you every single Thursday, if you are a commuter, there is free food in the Joyful Sound Room at 1130. It's good. Our churches are kind to us. And next, let me have your attention. Tomorrow night, Lord willing, with weather, we will have founts, and we are going to hear about how to study the Scripture. We've been excited at the way the Lord's been working in that gathering as we come together for worship and then the, to pray together and be mobilized around the mission of Jesus. Now, on Monday, you heard a bit of a shout out for, what was it? Unreal City. Unreal City, yes, I knew you were eager. They had already their first weekend in Billingsley Theater, and we want to encourage you to go. You have a full weekend now of opportunity. It's their second weekend. It's the final weekend of Unreal City. Go and support our theater and hear this well-done production. Next is coming Family Weekend. So are, are your parents coming to this? Anybody? There are a few of you. Okay, okay. Your, a few of your parents are coming. Let me show you what we've got. Here we go. With Family Weekend, we have your attention again. So Trailblazer Park on Friday night, there is a movie being shown in Traveler's Rest. That is going to be followed by a pickleball tournament Saturday morning at 10. And that is going to be followed by the tailgating both for parents and for students 5 p.m. on Saturday evening. And for this game, 7 p.m., wear red. So Let's come and support. We'll have parents there. We'll have you there. There'll be lots of good food. Um, students are going to be in our circle for tailgating and then all the way down that central aisle uh, walkway headed toward the stadium. One last announcement, and then I'll introduce our speaker. Midterm Midnight Madness, 8 p.m. Sunday night in A.V. Wood to just prep you any kind of tutoring, encouragement, help that you need in preparing for midterms. Now, let me introduce our speaker. We'll get started. So our speaker for today is Dr. Nathan Finn. He is, that's right, he is Professor of Faith and Culture and the Executive Director of the Institute for Transformational Leadership. I want to tell you what he's talking about and just kind of tie it together and give it up to him. We have heard that every single one of you are image bearers, and as you are an image bearer and engage the culture under the Lordship of Jesus, representing him, you always engage with image bearers. They always have equal dignity and worth, reflecting the glory of the Father. So we do that, and we do that as believers in this room, as torchbearers, lights in the darkness. And we do that recognizing that we're not the first ones to engage a culture that is not in favor of Christianity. We learn lessons from history even about how ancient cultures dealt with living in a pagan world. And so today, even just to consider how has the Lord worked among students for the sake of his name among the nations on college and university campuses, that's what we're going to talk about. Let me pray. Father, be at work in us today. Be at work to open hearts, to hear, to receive, to be reminded that you are a powerful God, that you are at work in the world, and that you have a message for us that you desire to use us for your purposes, to fill us with joy in knowing you, and to make you known. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Did you know that today, right now, 
as we're in this room, the largest missions gathering in the history of Christianity is taking place. 5,000 mission leaders from 200 countries are in Seoul, South Korea, joined by over 20,000 people who are participating all around the world who are live streaming that event as delegates. It's called uh, Seoul 2024, and it's part of the Lausanne movement. A few of you may have heard of that before, but it is a movement that is dedicated to promoting two related ideas. The idea that the whole world needs spiritual awakening and that part of that spiritual awakening is God raising up people to carry the gospel with them here, there, and everywhere. Spiritual awakening and missions happening right now in Seoul, Korea. Here's the thing. These two ideas of spiritual awakening and missions have always gone together through church history. There's no one formula that explains every situation They've just always had kind of a symbiotic relationship. They just go together like peanut butter and jelly. Or they just go together like Clemson and mediocrity on the football field. Some things, some things are just intended to go together. And that's been the case with spiritual awakening and missions. And to our point this morning, it has been the case when it comes to spiritual awakening and missions among college students. So this morning, what I want to do during our time together is share with you some examples of that pattern of how spiritual awakening and missions have often gone together among college students from the 1700s until the day before yesterday. Now, I'm a historian of Christianity, but I want to be clear, this is not an academic lecture. You're welcome. This is not an academic lecture. Because, you see, I'm not just a historian of Christianity, but I am a preacher. And what I want this morning is for this material that we're talking about to not just be informative, but you're going to learn some things. It's not just informative. I also want it to be encouraging. And I want it to be challenging. And I want you to not only listen along, but think about what you're hearing as we talk about this theme of how God has worked among colleges and universities for the sake of spiritual awakening and missionary mobilization. And I want every one of us to leave chapel this morning longing for spiritual renewal in our own lives and across our university and to be willing to go wherever God calls us to go and do whatever God calls us to do. So that's where we're going this morning, and I want to begin with the first case study. We'll look at about five different case studies. I want to think about the first case study. It is the first great awakening. Do you know why it's called the first great awakening? Because it was the first one. So the first one in America, at least. So that's why I'm mean, nothing clever here. It's the first great awakening. So here's where we start. In the 1740s, the spiritual movement that we now call the First Great Awakening was touching communities across the East Coast, all the way down south in Savannah, Georgia, all the way up into Maine. It was uh, even through this area uh, in Charleston. So the First Great Awakening in the 1700s. And in 1740 and 1741, revival came to a school you've heard of before, Yale University. Then it was Yale College. And it happened in chapel. And it happened because different ministers were coming and speaking in chapel, just like we see happen at North Greenville University. But one of those ministers was the most famous man in the colonies in the generation before George Washington became George Washington. His name was George Whitfield. George Whitfield was the greatest evangelist of the 18th century. 
And when he preached at Yale, revival came to Yale, and it deeply impacted that student body. But I want to tell you about two of those students. The first was a young man named David Brainerd. And Brainerd, as a result of what happened whenever he was in chapel at Yale University, felt called to become a missionary, a cross-cultural missionary to the Mohican tribe, sometimes spelled the Mohicans, like last of the Mohicans. Uh, He ministered to the Mohican tribe in New York and New Jersey, but his life met a tragic young end. 29 years old, he died of tuberculosis. And if that was the only thing that was true of him, we probably wouldn't know who he was. But before he died, David Brainerd wrote a book. He wrote his memoirs. And after he died, the famous uh, pastor and theologian, Jonathan Edwards, his name will come up a couple of times in the next few minutes, he edited and he published David Brainerd's story in book form. It was called The Life of David Brainerd. Have any of you ever heard of The Life of David Brainerd? I see hands that are going up. The Life of David Brainerd became not just a bestseller then, but a perennial bestseller that has never gone out of print. And God has used that book, The Life of David Brainerd, to encourage countless people to become missionaries, to take the gospel to other cultures. In fact, when I talk to groups of missionaries today, I always ask them how many of you were influenced by the life of David Brainerd and easily 75% of them raise their hands as either that book shaping their call to missions or being a great encouragement to them after they've become missionaries. The second student is a man named Samuel Hopkins. Samuel Hopkins isn't as famous as Brainerd, but he was almost as famous during his lifetime. You can see he was born with one of those little hats like they give babies in the hospital. Uh, I don't know why his, uh, his, his, hat is, his hat game is so strong, but nevertheless, there it is. So Hopkins graduates from Yale, and he studies for the ministry with Jonathan Edwards, that famous pastor and theologian. And Samuel Hopkins becomes the most famous pastor and theologian during his lifetime. But for our purposes... He's not only a famous theologian, but he becomes the leading white anti-slavery advocate in New England during his lifetime. Like many New Englanders during his lifetime, Christian and non-Christian, he believed that slavery was okay early in his life. In fact, he owned slaves early in his life. But as he matures in his Christian faith, he becomes convicted by the Holy Spirit that it's not enough to just treat slaves well and care for them and attempt to share the gospel with them, but that God is opposed to human enslavement based on the color of someone's skin or their nation of origin. And so he not only frees his slaves, but he advocates for everybody freeing their slaves. And he encouraged a group of former slaves who had become called to the ministry to travel to Western Africa as missionaries and to take the gospel back to the lands their ancestors had been stolen from as a part of what God was doing in their lives. Both of these men, David Brainerd, Samuel Hopkins, lives changed as college students at Yale College. Our second case study also begins at Yale College, and the second case study is the Second Great Awakening. Can you guess why it's called the Second Great Awakening? Because it's the second one, right? Church historians are so boring. It's the Second Great Awakening. And in 1795, a man named Timothy Dwight becomes the president of Yale College. There's a... uh, There's a Dwight College at Yale University that's named for him today. There's a Timothy Dwight Hall. He was the grandson of Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards keeps cropping up up in these early days. Uh, But when Timothy Dwight comes to Yale, those revivals of 50 years earlier had fizzled out. 
and there was widespread unbelief among their student body. In fact, this is going to shock you. It's going to appall you. It's going to keep you up at night. Their students were so rowdy, they would even misbehave in chapel sometimes. Right? They would talk. They would talk. They would be rowdy. They would try to look at their phones when nobody was looking. They would even, they would even jeer speakers when they came. But in 1802, revival broke out on the campus of Yale University and about one third of their students became Christians in an eight or 10 week period of time. It was remarkable. And this began a series of revivals off and on on the Yale University campus for the next 30 years. In fact, Yale becomes the seedbed for the Second Great Awakening. It flows out of Yale, and it begins to move to other schools, especially in New England, including Williams College, today a prestigious liberal arts college uh, that's in Massachusetts. But revival comes to Yale College, and there... In 1806, five Williams students were discussing what they had talked about in class, the the need for the gospel to be preached to all nations and, and what that would look like, especially in Asia, and a storm broke out. We're going to have a little bit of weather here in the next couple of days, and so maybe you'll, you'll pick up a tip from what these students do. They're uh, walking around the campus, and they're talking about missions, and the big storm breaks out, and they hide under a haystack, not because it's a haystack, uh, but because it's a place where they can get out of the rain. So they get out of the rain, and they're trapped there for several hours, and during that time, they just pray about missions. They, they redeem the time that they're there, praying for missions, and that event under that haystack has come to be called the haystack prayer meeting because of the impact that it has that it has four years later those students were out of college but all of them were still excited about missions and they came together with another group of pastors who cared about missions who had not been at the college and that group formed the first foreign mission society in the new nation in 1810. It has a really long name that I'm not going to tell you because then you'll fall asleep and you'll be tempted to misbehave, but it was the first missions organization in American history. And two years later in 1812, that board sent out the first five official foreign missionaries in American history. The first five people who lived in America but felt called to go somewhere else and share the gospel. Lots of people had gone to share the gospel because they were in the military or because they were diplomats or because they had international business interests. But these were the first five people who felt called to go somewhere else specifically for the purpose of sharing the gospel. The two most famous were Adoniram and Ann Judson. Have any of you heard of Adoniram Judson and Ann Judson? Uh, These two individuals were household names in America in the 1830s and the 1840s. Millions of people all over the English-speaking world would read about their exploits in their secular newspapers. That's how well-known these individuals were. They were missions pioneers. But there was another missions pioneer as well a man named Samuel Mills. And his story is really interesting. He had been at the Haystack Revival. He was the leader of the pack. He was the alpha among those young men who were praying about missions. And he was so energetic and and was able to get people excited that whenever he put his own name forward to serve as a missionary, that mission society said, no, we're not going to send you as a missionary because we need you to use your gifts to get everybody else excited about missions. And so that became his calling. And he traveled all over the country talking about missions and raising money for missions. He did end up doing cross-cultural mission work. He didn't go to another uh, country across the globe. He worked among Native American tribes uh, in the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, But he also became the founder of the American Bible Society, the oldest Bible society in America. Some of you were at Stephen Presley's uh, Monday Night Pals lecture. He talked about the American Bible Society. It was founded by Samuel Mills. So once again, college students, 
under a haystack, praying about missions, God uses them to begin the modern missions movement in America, where Christians in America go to other places because God has called them to spread the gospel to other people. Fast forwarding in time, our third case study is the student volunteer movement. The student volunteer movement. In July of 1885, the first ever intercollegiate Christian conference that we know about was held. Like how many of you have ever heard of a conference like Passion? Have you heard of Passion? Or how many of you have heard of something like, uh, you know, a state missions conference for college students? This is the first sort of conference like that that we know of. 1885 in Northfield, Massachusetts. 251 students from 89 schools attended a three-week conference in July. Yeah, suffering for Jesus, right? So three weeks in July, 251 students. The major sponsor for the conference was the YMCA, which at that time uh, stood for the Young Men's Christian Association. Uh, The YMCA had actually started in 1844 as a ministry to men, who were moving to large cities looking for new work, and the YMCA combined exercise and athletic competition with evangelistic outreach and Bible studies. Because of that, in an era before ministries like the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and Athletes in Action, many colleges in the 1800s had YMCA chapters so that they could uh, combine athletics and ministry. That was super common. So, The YMCA is the sponsor of this conference, and the speaker was a man named Dwight Moody, or D.L. Moody. How many of you have heard of D.L. Moody before? Lots of hands going up. D.L. Moody was the leading evangelist in the late 19th century, and his ministry really had three things that he talked about. Like, these were the themes he returned to over and over again. Jesus could come back at any time. Because Jesus could come back at any time, those who don't believe in Jesus need to trust Jesus while there is still time, and missionaries need to go everywhere to tell people about Jesus while there is still time. Moody traveled everywhere to tell people about Jesus. In fact, the year before this college conference in 1884, he went and spoke at Cambridge University in England. And seven wealthy young men who were tracking to become part of the the British aristocracy and and be in the House of Lords and and to be big uh, leaders in that culture, seven young men felt called to be missionaries to other lands after they heard D.L. Moody speak at Cambridge. They were called the Cambridge Seven, and their story was reported in newspapers all over the world. And those students in America at that conference knew about the Cambridge Seven. They'd been reading about their story. And so they went to D.L. Moody and they said, Can we have a missions meeting here? They had been gathering together and praying through the conference for the first week about a, uh, a missions meeting. They wanted students at the conference to consider missions. And so they go to Moody and say, can we have a missions emphasis? And Moody says, sure, I believe in missions. Let's do that. And they had two missionaries added to the program at the last minute. And what happened is God moved among those students. Out of 251, 100 of them felt called to missions during the next few weeks, or the next few days. 100 of the 251 committed to foreign missions. And after the conference ended, they continued to gather back at their home campuses that they had come from to go to the Northfield Conference. And the movement began to grow. Within a year of that conference, at least 2,200 students at 167 schools had committed to become foreign missionaries. In 1888, because of all of these students who felt called to missions, a new organization was started called the Student Volunteer Movement, the SVM. 
And the motto of the student volunteer movement was the evangelization of the world in this generation. And they started having a college conference every four years. Again, something kind of like passion. Between 1888 and about 1920, 20,000 missionaries left America to go to other lands because they were called to missions while they were college students and were a part of this movement. 20,000 people over about a 35-year period of time. And it all started with 251 college students gathered together to study the Bible and to pray and to say, why don't we have a missions emphasis. Let me mention a couple of the students that were there who become great leaders. The first is a man named Samuel Zwimmer. Isn't that a great name? Samuel Zwimmer. He was a missionary in the Middle East for decades before joining the faculty of Princeton Theological Seminary as their professor of missions during the second half of his career. But Zwimmer's nickname was the Apostle to Islam. And during his lifetime, he was the world's leading expert on how Christians can share the gospel with Muslims in other places. The other key leader was a man named John R. Mott. Mott's the other guy up there. And he was an early leader in the student volunteer movement who helped found something called the World Christian Federation in 1895 as an umbrella group for all the campus ministries all over the English-speaking world. And Mott became the most important advocate in his lifetime for both campus ministry and for global missions. And he wed those two eyes together. In fact, in 1910, the, uh, the World Missionary Conference in Edinburgh, Scotland became the largest missions meeting ever at that time. With 1,200 students from dozens of nations, John R. Mott brought them together. That meeting happening in Seoul right now with 5,000 people there and 20,000 people participating online is an heir to that first meeting in 1910 in Edinburgh where 1,200 people were there from dozens of countries. That student volunteer movement, a missions revival among college students, impacts the entire world. Our fourth case study this morning is something similar called the Urbana Movement, and we're getting closer to our modern era now. In 1948, how many of you have ever heard of InterVarsity? Maybe you have friends at a state university that are part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. In 1948, InterVarsity hosted a missions conference for college students at the University of Illinois in Urbana, Illinois. That's why it's called the Urbana Movement. And the theme of that conference was from every campus to every country. The keynote speaker at that conference was a young evangelist named Billy Graham, who six months later would, became, would become the most famous evangelist in American history after he led a six-week evangelistic campaign in Los Angeles, California that made front-page news for weeks. But he wasn't famous yet. And at that meeting, there were around 1,300 students from 154 campuses at Urbana who are thinking about missions. And one of them was a student from Wheaton College named Jim Elliott. And just a few years later, Jim Elliott would graduate from Wheaton and he would go to Ecuador where in 1956... Elliot and four other of his partners in their mission were martyred for their faith, trying to work among a violent, sort of culturally primitive people group that was cut off from the rest of the world in Ecuador. Their deaths made international news. They were on the front page of papers and magazines all over the country, and Jim's widow, Elizabeth, her picture was up there alongside of him, published a book about Jim's ministry and his martyrdom titled Through Gates of Splendor. And then she published another book a couple of years later, a biography of Jim titled Shadow of the Almighty. And those two books became 
international bestsellers, a lot like David Brainerd's memoirs uh, 200 years earlier. These books about Jim Elliot were read by people all over the world, and God used Jim Elliot's story. He died sharing the gospel, and God used that story to call all kinds of people to faith in Christ, and it all began at a missions conference where Jim Elliot was there with other college students. In the decades that followed, students continued to attend those Urbana conferences in larger and larger numbers. The biggest one was in 1976 when 17,000 college students from all over the country were there. The keynote speakers included Elizabeth Elliot, the widow of Jim Elliot, uh, John Stott, the most famous preacher at the time in the English-speaking world, and a woman named Helen Rosevere a medical missionary who served in the Congo for 20 years and was uh, imprisoned and tortured for her faith by uh, guerrilla revolutionaries who were trying to overthrow the government in Congo. Again, 17,000 students who were there because they're interested in missions. Now, I want to be a historian for just a minute and say that as we talk about the student volunteer movement and the Urbana movement, this is a good example of how words like revival and spiritual awakening are difficult to define sometimes. I mean, a college conference that's held every two or three years isn't the same thing as revival breaking out in chapel at Yale University, right? I mean, those are two different sorts of things. But... In both cases, God moved. Sometimes it was in a big, dramatic way. Sometimes it was a slow burn when somebody who had been at that conference a few years later goes and puts their yes on the table for the Lord. But this is what God does. He moves in lots of different ways among all people, but we're talking about college students, to bring about his purposes. I've experienced this a little bit myself. In 1999, I attended the third ever Passion Conference as a sophomore in college. And my own ministry was deeply shaped by being at that conference and especially by the preaching of a man named John Piper. How many of you have heard of John Piper before? It was amazing. In 2000, the year after I was there, 40,000 college students gathered in an open field in Memphis, Tennessee for an event called Passion One Day where Piper preached a sermon to those college students titled Don't Waste Your Life. Some of you have seen the book that was published right afterwards that's just an expansion of that sermon, Don't Waste Your Life. And literally millions of people all over the world have streamed that sermon or read that book And God has used it to help call countless people to missions. Whether that was to go and be a full-time missionary or whether that was for them to think missionally about whatever their vocation was and how they could spread the gospel and make disciples in the midst of that vocation. God still moves. And that brings us to our final case study. I told you I'd take you from the 1740s to the day before yesterday. Well, maybe not the day before yesterday, but how about 2023? Our fifth case study is the Asbury Revival of 2023. Asbury University is a Christian school, a lot like North Greenville, that's located in the small town of Wilmore, Kentucky. And Asbury has a really interesting history with revival. Their school documents at least eight different periods of awakenings among their students going back to the early 1900s. And until 2023, their most famous ever revival occurred in 1970. That was during a time called the Jesus Movement. Have any of you seen the movie Jesus Revolution? Or have you heard of the Jesus people? This was during that time period in 1970. There's a picture up there on the screen of the revival that breaks out at Asbury. And that revival played a significant role in promoting spiritual awakening in local churches. It impacted dozens of other college campuses besides Asbury. At least 2,000 witness teams from Asbury students and Asbury alums and friends of Asbury students 
went out and spread the gospel all over the country and even overseas in the two or three years after the Asbury Revival. There's actually a documentary of the Asbury Revival that you can find on YouTube. I've shown it to some of my classes, and I would recommend it to you. It's a little bit grainy. It's from the early 70s, uh, but they interview people who were there, and there's original footage, and it's just really encouraging. And so I would encourage you to uh, look for that, the 1970 Asbury Revival. But that brings us to February 8th of 2023. That morning, students remained in Asbury's regularly scheduled chapel service after the conclusion to pray together. And then they began to publicly confess their sins. And then some of them began to share their testimonies. And then a lot of them began to sing. Those student-led organic gatherings continued for almost two and a half weeks. And out of those gatherings, uh, a larger group of formal and informal gatherings uh, took place around the clock for almost two and a half weeks in multiple locations on Asbury's campus and at Asbury Theological Seminary, which is a sister school from them that's right across the street. We live in a digital age. And so news of this 2023 Asbury revival went viral on social media. And within a couple of days, all of us knew about it. And folks all over the country were talking about this revival. Both religious and secular news outlets started writing articles about the Asbury revival. And crowds as large as 15,000 people were going to Asbury University every day. Wilmore, the town of Wilmore, Kentucky, only has about 8,000 residents. So they were doubling their town's population every day with people who were coming from all over the country to see what God was doing at Asbury University. Now, I'm sure some of that was just religious tourism. People want to know what's up. They want to know what the story is. But the vast majority of those who made that pilgrimage to Asbury were longing to experience revival in their own lives. Social media was filled with reports of crowds that for the most part, just quietly and respectfully watched the students and prayed for the students quietly as they were praying out loud, just showing spiritual solidarity with those young people as the Lord was at work in their lives. College students from all over the country traveled to Asbury, including many from Christian universities. In the immediate aftermath of that Asbury revival, several other schools reported spiritual movements on their campuses, sometimes with grassroots organic gatherings, other times setting apart formal times to, to pray for revival. Uh, just to give some examples, uh, Cedarville University, a sister Christian school, experienced a revival. Samford University in Alabama, another Christian school, experienced a revival. Auburn University experienced a revival, a large secular campus. At North Greenville, many of our faculty, students, and staff had already been praying for God to pour out his spirit on our campus back at the beginning of that school year, from the beginning of that school year, the 2022-2023 the school year. And we had already seen dozens of students come to faith in Christ, many of them in chapel services. There was a heightened sense of spiritual expectation on our campus that year. And then Asbury happened over there in Kentucky. A few days after that revival began, dozens of students remained in our chapel one morning for prayer and testimonies following the conclusion of that regularly scheduled service. While that meeting sort of broke up later in the day, it resulted over the next several days with additional student-led gatherings in this room and all over campus. And those of us on faculty and staff would hear reports about students confessing sin, about students sensing a call to uh, the ministry of the gospel or sensing a call to be missionaries. And for the most part, we just tried to get out of the way. We didn't do anything except pray for those students and be available to talk with them if they sought us out. We just wanted to give them the space to respond to whatever the Lord was doing in their lives. Now, that was the spring of 2023, and this is the fall of 2024. It's not that much later. So it's still a little bit too soon to know what the long-term results of that Asbury revival and all the other smaller revivals that it led to 
are going to be. We just don't know. But this much we do know. God stirred the hearts of college students all over this country in that spring. And historically, when that has happened, it has often been the case that God has raised up large numbers of young people to spread the gospel here, there, and everywhere. So I want to close this morning by speaking first to the students who are here who know that you are a Christian. Are you willing to pray for spiritual renewal in your life and for spiritual awakening at our university? There's a risk that comes with that because there's no telling what God might do. But are you willing to pray for spiritual renewal in your life and for spiritual awakening on our campus? Christian student, are you willing to lay your yes on the table to whatever God is calling you to do, to obey him and to be about his business with whatever that looks like in your life, with your gifts and your sense of vocation and your desires and your personality? Are you willing to pray? Are you willing to be obedient? And for those of you who are here this morning who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ, I have a question for you too. Are you willing to just simply be open to whatever God might have in store for you that you don't expect because he has you at North Greenville University? Sure, he has you here to earn a degree. Maybe he has you here because you're a musician or because you're an athlete. Maybe he has you here because you grew up near here and we're close by. Maybe he has you here because you have friends here. Maybe he has you here because there's someone that you like who's here. There's lots of reasons he has you here. But I bet he has you here for other reasons that you've not thought about before. So are you willing to just say, God, I'm here and I don't know why. What do you have in store for me? I'm going to close this time with a word of prayer, but don't start packing up and zipping up yet because right after I pray, Joshua G is going to come up with one more closing announcement and then we'll be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness down through the ages as your spirit moves to bring revival and spiritual awakening, and as that spiritual awakening has often resulted in men and women who are moved to share the gospel and make disciples among other people in other places. And Lord, we rejoice in knowing that in your kind plan, it has often been through college students and university students that you've brought about these purposes. And Lord, our prayer is simply that you would help us to have soft hearts and open minds to whatever it might be that you want to do among us. We want to follow you. We want to be obedient to what you're doing here. We want you to work through us for your glory and our good and the sake of others. So help us to be in a posture to receive whatever you give us for those reasons. And we will give you all the praise and the honor and the glory for everything that you do in our lives and across this campus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.